In this lecture, we are going to discuss the changes you'll want to be aware of if you are transitioning from TensorFlow One to TensorFlow Two. Obviously, if you don't know anything about TensorFlow One, you can safely ignore this lecture. At a high level, I would summarize the changes to TensorFlow as simpler. So that's the main theme of this lecture. Things that used to be complicated in TensorFlow are generally now more clean and user friendly. Let's start by discussing one change you already know about: the Keras API. At a high level, Keras is an API specification. It tells you what the code I use should look like, but it doesn't say anything about what the implementation looks like. And this is why there is zero difference in how you build and train a model in, say, TensorFlow 1.14 versus TensorFlow 2.0. Of course, the internals are completely different, but as the user of the API, that is not what you have to worry about. Of course, that's not the whole story. You know, since we've spent many hours on it already, that the Keras API is the way to go in TensorFlow 2.0. But this has not always been true. In TensorFlow 1, you could use a conf2d layer from tf.layers.conf2d, or you could use tf.contrib.layers.conf2d, or you could simply define your own class to act as a layer, which we had done in the past. Of course, that's actually a really great strategy when you want to learn how things work and build from the ground up. But these days, the paradigm is shifting towards pre-built layers. So in TensorFlow 2.0, all those other layers have been removed, and the Keras API is the official way to build neural networks. That leads us to our next change, which is that the tf.contrib module has been removed. So if you're looking at a tutorial and you see tf.contrib, then you're looking at an old version of TensorFlow. The useful things from tf.contrib have been moved to new homes, so you don't have to worry about anything being thrown away. As a side note, if you want to build your own custom layer, say it does something that does not fall into the realm of dense convolution or RNN unit, then you can still do that. Through the Keras API, you would use what is called subclassing. All you need to do is subclass tf.keras.layers.layer and then define the computation for your layer. The next major change is that TensorFlow now uses eager execution by default, and along with that, there are no more sessions. Now, if you are new to TensorFlow, that probably sounds like a foreign language to you. So let me try to explain what's going on here. In order to understand this, you need to first understand how TensorFlow used to work. So here's some code in TensorFlow One. You define a variable a, and you define a variable b. And now you say c equals a plus b. Since a equals one and b equals two, and you know math, you might think, "Aha, c is three." But in fact, that's not true. If you tried to print C, TensorFlow would just tell you it's some generic tensor. The reason for this is TensorFlow One does not do computation on the fly. Instead, what you are really doing is called building a graph. When you define TensorFlow variables as functions of other variables, all you're doing is telling TensorFlow. How those variables are to be computed in the future. Now you might be wondering, what do I mean by in the future? A is one and B is two. What does in the future have to do with this? Well, to understand that, we have to first talk about placeholders. So here's how we would define a linear regression model in TensorFlow One. First, we would have our two variables A and B. Then you would have some input data x. Importantly, this input data x has no value; it is a placeholder. As you know, y hat is a times x plus b. But now, since x does not currently have a value, neither does y hat. In other words, we're just telling TensorFlow how all these variables are related. Y hat is a times x plus b, but they don't have values yet. It's only later, using a session, 
that these variables get values and we can see their output. So for example, let's say we want to set x to some value and get the corresponding y hat. In this case, we would call session.run, pass in y hat, and then using the feedict argument, we would pass in the input data for the placeholder x. So if a equals 1 and b equals 2 and x equals 3, then y hat would be 1 times 3 plus 2, which is 5. We could then later pass in another x, say 4, and that would give us 1 times 4 plus 2 equals 6. So x is only a placeholder, but we can give it values using session.run and then get out the corresponding y hats. Now, I've seen firsthand the frustration that can result when you're trying to learn deep learning and you come across sessions and graphs and so forth. In particular, none of this has anything to do with the theory of deep learning. That's why we've been able to give you over 10 hours of content on deep learning without ever having mentioned sessions. Unfortunately, a lot of beginners would get confused by this. They would think sessions are somehow an integral part of deep learning and that they must know sessions inside and out. It was truly weird. Most instructors I've known would just say, look, it's just some boilerplate code. You just have to put it there to make it work. But some students would not want to believe this. So it's a great thing that sessions are gone. Instead of sessions, we now have what is called eager execution. Basically, it's a fancy way of saying TensorFlow is going to act like a regular programming library, like NumPy or even just plain Python. In Python, when I say a equals 1 and b equals 2, and I print out a plus b, I expect to see 3. In fact, other deep learning libraries such as PyTorch work just like this. So what happened was, as TensorFlow 1 was going through its various iterations, one bright young engineer at Google decided to implement eager execution so that TensorFlow could act more like PyTorch and regular Python. In the later versions of TensorFlow 1, like TensorFlow 1.13 and TensorFlow 1.14, eager execution is actually implemented as a feature. The thing is, you'd have to turn it on manually. But in TensorFlow 2.0, eager execution is on by default. Now we have to wonder, was there a reason for TensorFlow to be implemented the way it was in the first place? Why would you want to build a computation graph and only pass values to it later on? The answer is that this actually all started with Theano, the very first GPU-enabled deep learning library for Python, which inspired TensorFlow and other deep learning libraries as well. The idea was you would compile this graph, and that compiled graph would be very fast. As a side note, this was what Keras was doing when you called model.compile, so if you had a Theano backend, it was actually compiling the Theano graph under the hood. So there's one disadvantage to not having sessions and predefining your graphs, which is that that actually makes things less efficient. Luckily, in TensorFlow 2.0, there is a solution to that, tf.function. We're not going to discuss that now, but just keep that in mind. If you want the performance benefits of sessions without actually having sessions, you can just use tf.function. For most of us, that's not even going to be a consideration, since we can do all the work in this course without it, but it's there for you if you need it. To summarize everything in this lecture, here's what we learned. First, we reviewed something, which we already kind of knew given the rest of this course. Using the Keras API is now the standard way of creating models. All the other pre-built layers are gone. tf.contrib is gone. If you want to create your own custom models and layers, you can subclass the Keras model class and the Keras layer class. Next, sessions are gone. Instead, eager execution is enabled by default. So there are no placeholders, no session.run, no tf.global variables initializer. All that stuff is gone. But if you want the efficiency of compiled graphs, then you should use the tf.function decorator.